up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and this is another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. What up, Chris? What's going on, Ethan? How are you, man? Doing well. We're gearing up for the quarter of the season, Mark. How you feeling? Yeah, feel pretty good. I think the Cavs should feel pretty good about where they stand as well. For them to be 10-8, and eight, given all the things that they dealt with in the first quarter of the season, I know they're not exactly where they want to be. They're still striving for more consistency. They're still striving for more continuity. They're trying to play the complete team game, but they are playing better basketball over the last week, week and a half. And I think there are some signs that point to them possibly making a rise up the standings and becoming the team that they were expected to be coming into this year. So Saturday's game against the Pistons marks the 20th game of the season for the Cavs. I want to take some stock on a couple of things and discuss where we think this team is and where it's going. How would you grade the team's performance to this point? At the 10 game mark, you gave them an F. Where do they stand now? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think they deserve a lot of credit for turning things around. They're 6 and 2 in their last 8 games. They're playing better defense. Their offense is starting to click a little bit. They're getting healthier. With health comes stability. With health comes continuity. So for them to be 10 and 8, given everything that they have dealt with, the difficult early portion of the schedule, like their schedule is going to be easier from here on out. They had that tough road trip to the West Coast. I think they should be really, really happy about their position at 10 and 8. There were games that they lost that they probably should have won. There were games that they won that I think a lot of people thought that they were going to lose. That happens during an 82-game season. But I think if we're being honest and trying to put it in real perspective, they deserve a lot of credit for getting themselves back above 500 to a winning team. And I would say at this point of the season, given everything that they've dealt with, they probably deserve right around a B little bit better than average if we have to assign grades like we don't always have to assign letter grades we don't but i I like it when we're on the same page because i said i'd give them a b minus because they are starting to look like a cohesive unit the team has been growing more effective together as the season has progressed and it simply looks like they're having more fun like as a former athlete i'd understand like the game doesn't come any smoother than when you're having fun with your teammates and just thriving off one another and like i don't know how often our fans are on the Cavs Twitter page, but they posted after the game against the Hawks that Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell had like a little embrace after the game of excitement. And it was just really good to see. Easier to have fun when you're winning. That's for sure. That's that's (laughs) always going to be the case. (laughs) That's always going to be the case. But obviously it's not just starting with the starting five, which we know is really good. What do you think of the rotations that J.B. Bickerstaff has been putting out there and as of late, decided between Tristan Thompson and Craig Porter Jr. as the ninth person in their rotation. Yeah, I mean, they're wonky, obviously, and I think they're still a work in progress, like so much of this team, and it's so hard to look at this team with such a critical eye and, and have a true gauge of who they are and who they can be, because so many things have been changing throughout the course of the first portion of this season. But I think the one thing that you can say is that they have an established top eight in their rotation and for a team that has playoff aspirations and beyond that's about the best that you can hope for and then what you get from those other guys 9 10 11 that's going to vary on a nightly basis that's going to vary as the season goes on and I think that's going to vary from team to team right if if anything I think that's just going to be a bonus or a luxury but they have an established top eight And it's a very, very good, reliable, relatively consistent top eight when fully healthy. And I think that's a really, really good place to be. Obviously, their starting five has been really formidable. They have found some other lineups that have worked well when it comes to Evan Mobley and four shooters. I think Jared Allen and four shooters can work also. Max Struess has shown that he can play small ball power forward if need be with Karis LeVert sliding into the small forward spot, or maybe even Isaac Okoro sliding into the small forward spot. So the thing that I would say about their rotation, Ethan, that has been impressive to me is that 
there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of versatility. And for JB, it seems like there are fewer either or propositions when it comes to those decisions. Like he doesn't have to give up as much offense when going to certain guys, or he doesn't have to give up as much defense when going to certain guys. And I think that's a really, really good situation for the Cavs to be in. And that's very, very different than the situation that they were in last year every time they turned to their bench. And the numbers for the Cavs bench are very, very similar to what they were last year in terms of the production, in terms of the deeper metrics. But you feel better about, at least I do, this Cavs bench compared to last year. Yeah, and I honestly think that debuts have been making, as of recent history, good decisions based on the teams that they're playing. Like, it's always going to be a nightly decision as to who you're going to have as your 9, 10, and 11 straight off the bench. But in recent history, with them playing a smaller team in the Hawks with a more athletic big man in Clint Capella, JB obviously opted to play Craig Porter Jr. and give the guards some breathing room on the defensive end at times with guarding Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. And even though Craig didn't have his best game, it still was a good option to just give Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Karis LeVert some breathing and air and say, okay, we're going to put this guy in who we know can do the job for an allotted amount of time. You have to be, Ethan. You have to be the conductor of the Craig Porter Jr. (laughs) We got to get you some kind of hat, maybe a pocket watch, a whistle. Something like that with Craig Porter Jr.'s initials on it or his number on it or something like that. Man, you can't, you can't man. do that when I when we have to talk about him later in the show. You make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he has been a revelation, though. And I think against bigger opponents, JB's also opted, like against the 76ers and the Raptors, to put Tristan Thompson in, who saw more minutes and played a huge role in those games, especially against the 76ers when he was able to stop Joel Embiid in the last couple of minutes. And also thinking back to the Raptors game and how he got two huge offensive boards that led to a five-point swing, which they needed to win the game. And I also just think that them having differential 9, 10, 11 based on who they're playing is going to make it harder for opposing teams to game plan and scheme for them because they have so many weapons throughout the bench that can do a certain job and they all know their role. Yeah, so I think that's a really key point that you made right there. They do have an understanding of their role. And the other thing is, they're okay with it. Tristan Thompson, at this stage of his career, understands that he's not going to be a a 30-minute-a-night guy. But you give him opportunities every now and then. You put your faith in him every now and then. You reward him for all of the stuff that he does behind the scenes. And you put him in games against some of these teams. And you allow him to succeed for you coming off the bench. And I think that's helpful. And I think that keeps him engaged. And I think it keeps his spirits high. And I think it keeps him understanding of his role. And the same thing when it comes to Dean Wade. Like when guys are missing in this starting lineup, he may be a fill-in starter to keep everybody else on the bench in their proper role and keep them comfortable and don't put Karras in the starting lineup and then reserve. Starting lineup, then reserve. Starting lineup, then reserve. The way that it was last year. So Dean knows, hey, when guys are out, that's when my biggest opportunity is going to come. When this team needs defense coming off the bench and size and some of that toughness, then they're going to go to me as the ninth guy. But when this team is fully healthy, my minutes are probably going to vary. My impact is probably going to vary. And the same thing when it comes to Craig Porter Jr. This is a guy on a two-way contract, an undrafted rookie free agent. He didn't come into this year saying... I think I'm going to be in the top eight of the Cavs rotation. This is a playoff team. They usually don't rely on these kinds of guys this early into the season. But the opportunity presented itself. He took advantage of it. And he understands part of his role is stay ready for that next opportunity. Don't know when it's going to come. Not going to be consistent minutes. Not going to be consistent shots. But when things happen, that's when I'm going to get a bigger opportunity. And having guys like that on your bench that understand their role and understand the situation that they're in is really, really important. And we also mentioned that Karis LeVert is going for that six man of the year award. And we talked to him today 
at practice and him just saying that the consistency of knowing that he's going to come off the bench every night rather right. than going into the starting lineup some nights and going to the bench some nights has been helpful for him to get into a rhythm, get into his minutes, get into his mindset. But here's the thing, Ethan. I'm sure JB would love to play all of these guys, right? But that is not reality. It's not going to happen. He is most comfortable with a nine or 10 man rotation. And you can sit here and you can say, hey, Chris, there are other coaches in the NBA that do it differently. There are other coaches in the NBA that like to play 11 and 12. They like to go deeper into their bench. Well, those coaches aren't coaching this team. And every coach has to do what they're most comfortable with, right? And JB is going to continue to do that. And as long as the players understand, it doesn't matter what the fans think. And with that, we're going to take a quick break. But don't go too far, because when we come back, we're going to talk about who's been the biggest surprise for the Cavs this season. Before that, remember to become a Cavs insider to interact with Chris and myself on subtext by becoming a subscriber. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from myself and Chris. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. We'll be right back. All right, Chris, I want to get into who's the biggest surprise for the Cavs, but I got made fun of one time this this podcast. Gee, <laughs> I wonder who the answer to this question is. <laughs> and so I'm going I'm to just tell you why, because I don't even got to say his name. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Yeah, because he went undrafted, <laughs> maybe, and he's playing big minutes on a team with playoff aspirations. And just understanding that he hasn't been caught up in any of the lights. It's never seemed too big for him. For a guy who has not played in a G League game, coming straight from college, even though he played more than most players are playing in college nowadays, coming to the NBA and saying, I'm not going to have to play in the G League. I'm going to be going up against Joel Embiid and laying it up on him to get a go-ahead bucket in a tight ball game and not change my facial expression at all. That's been the biggest surprise. Not even his play, which has been extraordinarily surprising, but just how he's gone about his business while doing that. I mean, this is the obvious answer. It's funny because when we were in Philadelphia for that in-season tournament game, I was sitting next to a couple of NBA scouts, and they were on media row, and all they were talking about, this was a game that featured Darius Garland, Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid, Jared Allen, Evan Mobley. All they could talk about was Craig Porter Jr. It was like you all over again. Hey. That's <laughs> all they were talking about. And they were saying, they were like, yo, this dude went into the game against the Golden State Warriors and he looked completely rattled. He missed five straight free throws. The Cavs had to put their starters back in because he couldn't dribble the ball up the court. Like all of this kind of stuff. And then they were like, to see where he has come from there to breaking teams down in the pick and roll and getting into the paint and finishing in traffic and knocking down outside shots, which was supposed to be a big weakness of his, which is one of the reasons why he went undrafted. To see like the evolution in such a short time for Craig Porter Jr. from the guy who looked completely rattled against the Golden State Warriors, where the Cavs had to reinsert their starters to a guy who looks like, hey, I belong here. I belong on the court with some of these players. I belong in this rotation when some of these guys for the Cavs are out. It has been unbelievable to watch. And these are the kinds of players, Ethan, that this team needs. Because this is a pricey team. Their top-level players are all high-salary guys. And this roster, if it stays together, is going to get really, really, really expensive into the future with the decision to make when it comes to Donovan Mitchell. And part of that's his decision. With a decision to make when it comes to Evan Mobley, that's the easiest decision that the Cavs are going to have to make. So they need to find like cheap, playable help. And Craig Porter Jr. is a guy who has shown 
that he is playable when guys are missing, when guys are in foul trouble, when the Cavs need to change up the flow offensively, they can go to him. So to have a guy who's making an impact on a two-way contract, that is a big, big-time luxury for a team that is trying to avoid the luxury tax at all costs. I figured you were going to go with that pun. I, I, I didn't know why, but I knew you were going to go with that pun. <laughs> Can I give another one because, like, this was such an easy one? Like, there's somebody else that has surprised me. I think Tristan Thompson has been a surprise. I mean, this is a guy, it was the last player that the Cavs signed this offseason. And the thinking was, all right, just a locker room lieutenant, just another voice, just somebody with big game experience that was going to bring all of the stuff that this kind of team needed behind the scenes. When he has gotten an opportunity on the court, he has looked better on the court than I thought he was going to. He still has something to give on the court. And I don't know that I thought that when the Cavs signed him. Look, he's not going to get big minutes. It's going to be like 8 to 12 minute bursts. But if those 8 to 12 minute bursts can be impactful as the third big on this team, on a team that has Jared Allen and Evan Moby swallowing many of those big minutes, that's just fine. Since you gave your second one, I got to give mine because I did not give him a lot of credit at the beginning of the season. But Dean Wade has been a pleasant surprise for me. Finally. Because, (laughs) I mean, we were talking earlier in the season. We had a podcast about it talking about if George Niang should be getting more minutes than Dean Wade. And I was on the other side of it. I thought George Niang was playing better than Dean Wade was. And that had a lot to do with looking at the box score and seeing Dean Wade play 33 minutes and him have zero points. Early time being a beat reporter on new on the beat. And I had barely any idea who Dean Wade was. Now I know. Because he's been able to lock up players like Kate Cunningham. He's been able to help out on the defensive end. And like you say a lot, he brings good spacing that the Cavs need and helps out in that form of being able to play on the defensive role, especially when Isaac Okora was out. But moving on to the last question of the podcast, what do you think needs to change as the season goes on or what do you think will improve naturally as the season progresses? The thing that stands out to me, Ethan, offensively is that, look, part of this is just going to be the reality of this team. Darius Garland is an elite pick and roll player. Donovan Mitchell is an elite pick and roll player. And Jared Allen is one of the best pick and roll bigs in the entire NBA. So the Cavs are going to continue to use that as their bread and butter. But I think the thing that I'm looking to see whether it can evolve is if their reliance on that can dissipate when they're healthier, when they're more comfortable playing together, when they understand better the strengths and weaknesses of Max Struess and how to play alongside a guy like that. It seems like so much of the Cavs offense starts with the pick and roll and some of their side actions with running off ball, running off screens and stuff like that is where they're trying to get the diversity. But I want to see if they can expand even more. Use Evan Mobley as a hub. Tap into that playmaking. He had, what, seven assists the other night, I want to say? Five assists the other night? Jared Allen and him together had five assists in one game. So just, it doesn't have to be those guys finishing possessions all the time. It can be. They're capable of it. But I think sometimes having them initiate and create in a different kind of way other than the pick and roll, I think would be good for the Cavs. And I think it's going to continue to come. But I understand why the Cavs have relied on it in the early going and kind of used it as their safety net because it's what they're great at, right? And you don't want to change what you're great at, but you want to enhance it and you want to try and diversify your offense. And I think that is something I'm going to look for, and I think that's something that is going to come as this season continues to progress. I believe that as the chemistry builds, that the shot selection is going to get even better for the Cavs. Like, against the Hawks, we saw multiple possessions when the ball was passed around like seven times, and that automatically creates better looks for the offense because the defense just simply can't keep up. And I think that's going to come with added trust because at the beginning of the season, to me, 
it felt like Donovan Mitchell especially seemed like he needed to get a bucket because other shots weren't falling for other players. Obviously, that was when Darius Garland and Jared Allen were out, so that might have been the game plan. And now, we're seeing that with everybody healthy and meshing together, it doesn't feel like Donovan is playing like he has to get buckets on his own because that's how the Cavs are going to stay in the game, but he's still penetrating into the paint but now with more of a watchful eye for a kickout or a lob or even another cutter. Like we saw Darius cut into the lane while as a trailer the other night. And because we all know that Donovan is going to get his and can just simply cook defenders, but now it doesn't feel like it's as forced, which has been beneficial for not only his shot percentage, but also his teammates. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I think the evolution of him and Darius together is something that I'm going to be monitoring. I think the combination of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley together is something that I'm going to be monitoring because it's clear that the Cavs are exploring and dabbling with the Evan Mobley and four shooters and Jared Allen and four shooters, and it's been successful for them. And that means maybe taking a slight step back on the defensive end because the minutes are fewer with Evan and Jared together. But if they can survive those minutes or even perform well in those minutes with one of those guys on the bench, that just raises their offensive ceiling to a different level. And it's no offense to Jared. It's no offense to Evan. But a big with four spacers just creates different kinds of problems for an opposing defense. A big with four shooters creates a different kind of problem for an opposing defense. And it's something that I'm not saying that the Cavs are going to change their starting lineup or their closing lineup or something like that. But as the game goes on, just like the other night against Atlanta, when the Cavs were kind of sloggy on the offensive end, when shots weren't coming in the flow, when things weren't coming as easy as they would like against not a great defensive team in Atlanta, what did they do? They went to Mobley and four shooters. And that led to a run. That led to them taking the lead going into the second half. It gave them a little bit of an offensive jolt, and they carried it over into the second half. So moments throughout the course of the game when the Cavs can go to that and feel comfortable doing that and not feel like they lose something on the defensive end will be really, really beneficial. Because in the playoffs, Ethan, you know this, you have to give different looks. You have to try different lineups. Sometimes you're going to play a guy in one series and he's not going to play as much in the other series. Like Kevin Love back in the day of the NBA Finals runs that the Cavs went on, like there were times, there were certain matchups where he just wasn't as effective. That didn't mean that he wasn't important to the Cavs. It didn't mean that he didn't have a role on the Cavs. It just meant there were certain matchups that weren't as favorable for him and they were more favorable for other players. Richard Jefferson against the Golden State Warriors instead of Kevin Love against the Golden State Warriors. So there could be, some of those matchups that the Cavs run into where it makes more sense for them to split up Jarrett and Evan. And they have to get comfortable enough doing that in the regular season so that they then can go to that in the postseason. I think my favorite part of seeing that four guard lineup was that we had talked about it literally the day before and had published that podcast the same day that they did it and (laughs) i'm sitting over here watching it happen i'm like they're really about to put four guards in wait did did jb listen to the podcast this is influencing what the Cavs are doing but even though that's unlikely i I just thought the coincidence was very nice it's almost like i have a pulse of this team not like you haven't been around here for (laughs) a couple years or nothing no that's that's not the case but If you want to feel how maybe J.B. Bickerstaff felt, make sure you tune in to the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. That'll wrap this episode. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with myself and Chris by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up Stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe, we out.